Section 13 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book 2 Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment or Analytic of Principles Chapter 2 System of All Principles of the Pure Understanding Section 3 Systematic Representations of All Synthetical Principles of the Pure Understanding 1. Axioms of Intuition 2. Anticipations of Perception 3. Analogies of Experience First Analogy Principle of the Permanence of Substance that principles exist at all is to be ascribed solely to the pure understanding, which is not only the faculty of rules in regard to that which happens, but is even the source of principles according to which everything that can be presented to us as an object is necessarily subject to rules. Because without such rules, we never could attain to cognition of an object. Even the laws of nature, if they are contemplated as principles of the empirical use of the understanding, possess also a characteristic of necessity, and we may therefore at least expect them to be determined upon grounds which are valid a priori and antecedent to all experience. But all laws of nature without distinction are subject to higher principles of the understanding, inasmuch as the former are merely applications of the latter to particular cases of experience. These higher principles alone therefore give the conception which contains the necessary condition and, as it were, the exponent of a rule. Experience, on the other hand, gives the case which comes under the rule. There is no danger of our mistaking merely empirical principles for principles of the pure understanding, or conversely, for the character of necessity according to conceptions which distinguish the latter and the absence of this in every empirical proposition, how extensively valid soever it may be, is a perfect safeguard against confounding them. There are, however, pure principles a priori, which, nevertheless, I should not ascribe to the pure understanding for this reason that they are not derived from pure conceptions, but, although by the mediation of the understanding, from pure intuitions. But understanding is the faculty of conceptions, such principles mathematical science possesses, but their application to the experience, consequently their objective validity, nay, the possibility of such a priori synthetical cognitions, the deduction thereof, rests entirely upon the pure understanding. On this account, I shall not reckon among my principles those of mathematics, though I shall include those upon the possibility and objective validity a priori, of principles of the mathematical science, which consequently are to be looked upon as the principle of these, and which proceed from conceptions to intuition and not from intuition to conceptions. In the application of the pure conceptions of the understanding to possible experience, the employment of their synthesis is either mathematical or dynamical, 
for it is directed partly on the intuition alone, partly on the existence of phenomenon. But the a priori conditions of intuition are in relation to a possible experience absolutely necessary. Those of the existence of objects of a possible empirical intuition are in themselves contingent. Hence, the principles of the mathematical use of the categories will possess a character of absolute necessity, that is, will be apodictic. Those, on the other hand, of the dynamical use, the character of an a priori necessity indeed, but only under the condition of empirical thought in an experience therefore only mediately and indirectly. Consequently, they will not possess that immediate evidence which is peculiar to the former, although their application to experience does not, for that reason, lose its truth and certitude. But of this point we shall be better able to judge at the conclusion of this system of principles. The table of categories is naturally our guide to the table of principles, because these are nothing else than rules for the objective employment of the former. Accordingly, all principles of the pure understanding are 1. Axioms of intuition. 2. 3. Anticipations, analogies of perception of experience. 4. Postulates of empirical thought in general. These appellations I have chosen advisedly in order that we might not lose sight of the distinctions in respect of the evidence and the employment of these principles. It will, however, soon appear that a fact which concerns both the evidence of these principles and the a priori determination of phenomena, according to the categories of quantity and quality, if we attend merely to the form of these. The principles of these categories are distinguishable from those of the two others, inasmuch as the former are possessed of an intuitive, but the latter of a merely discursive, though in both instances a complete certitude. I shall therefore call the former mathematical and the latter dynamical principles. Footnote 29 to follow. It must be observed, however, that by these terms I mean that just as little in the one case the principles of mathematics as those of general, physical, dynamics in the other. I have here in view merely the principles of the pure understanding in their application to the internal sense, without distinction of the representations given therein, by means of which the sciences of mathematics and dynamics become possible. Accordingly, I have named these principles rather with reference to their application than their content and I shall now proceed to consider them in the order in which they stand in the table. Footnote 29. All combination, conjunctio, is either composition, compositio, or connection, nexus. The former is the synthesis of a manifold, the parts of which do not necessarily belong to each other. For example, the two triangles in which a square is divided by a diagonal do not necessarily belong to each other, 
and of this kind is the synthesis of the homogeneous in everything that can be mathematically considered. This synthesis can be divided into those of aggregation and coalition, the former of which is applied to extensive, the latter to intensive quantities. The second sort of combination, nexus, is the synthesis of a manifold, insofar as its parts do belong necessarily to each other. For example, the accident to a substance or the effect to the cause. Consequently, it is a synthesis of that which, though heterogeneous, is represented as connected a priori. This combination, not an arbitrary one, I entitle dynamical because it concerns the connection of the existence of the manifold. This again may be divided into the physical synthesis of the phenomena divided among each other, and the metaphysical synthesis or the connection of phenomena a priori in the faculty of cognition. 1. Axioms of intuition. The principle of these is, all intuitions are extensive quantities. Proof. All phenomena contain, as regards their form, an intuition in space and time, which lies a priori at the foundation of all without exception. Phenomena, therefore, cannot be apprehended that is received into empirical consciousness otherwise than through the synthesis of a manifold through which the representations of a determinate space or time are generated, that is to say, through the composition of the homogeneous and the consciousness of the synthetical unity of this manifold, homogeneous. Now, the consciousness of a homogeneous manifold in intuition, insofar as thereby the representation of an object is rendered possible, is the conception of a quantity, quanti. Consequently, even the perception of an object as phenomenon is possible only through the same synthetical unity of the manifold of the given sensuous intuition, through which the unity of the composition of the homogeneous manifold in the conception of a quantity is cogitated. That is to say, all phenomena are quantities and extensive quantities because, as intuitions in space or time, they must be represented by means of the same synthesis through which space and time themselves are determined. An extensive quantity I call that wherein the representation of the parts renders possible and therefore necessarily antecedes the representation of the whole. I cannot represent to myself any line, however small, without drawing it in thought, that is, without generating from a point all its parts one after another and in this way alone producing this intuition. Precisely the same is the case with every, even the smallest portion of time. I cogitate therein only the successive progress from one moment to another, and hence, by means of the different portions of time and the addition of them, a determinate quantity of time is produced. As the pure intuition in all phenomena 
is either time or space, so is every phenomenon in its character of intuition an extensive quantity inasmuch as it can only be cognized in our apprehension by successive synthesis, from part to part. All phenomena are accordingly to be considered as aggregates, that is, as a collection of previously given parts, which is not the case with every sort of quantities but only those which are represented and apprehended by us as extensive. On this successive synthesis of the productive imagination in the generation of figures is founded the mathematics of extension or geometry, with its axioms which express the conditions of sensuous intuition a priori, under which alone the schema of a pure conception of external intuition can exist. For example, quote, between two points only one straight line is possible, end quote. Quote, two straight lines cannot enclose a space, end quote, etc., these are the axioms which properly relate only to quantities, quanta, as such. But as regards the quantity of a thing, quantitas, that is to say, the answer to the question, quote, how large is this or that object, end quote, although in respect to this question, we have various propositions, synthetical and immediately certain, in demonstra belia. We have, in the proper sense of the term, no axioms. For example, the proposition, quote, if equals be added to equals, the wholes are equal, end quote. Quote, if equals be taken from equals, the remainders are equal, end quote, are analytical because I am immediately conscious of the identity of the production of the one quantity with the production of the other, whereas axioms must be a priori synthetical propositions. On the other hand, the self-evident propositions as to the relation of numbers are certainly synthetical but not universal, like those of geometry, and for this reason cannot be called axioms but numerical formulae. That 7 plus 5 equals 12 is not an analytical proposition, for neither in the representation of 7 nor of five, nor of the composition of the two numbers, do I cogitate the number twelve. Whether I cogitate the number in the addition of both is not at present the question, for in the case of an analytical proposition, the only point is whether I really cogitate the predicate in the representation of the subject. But although the proposition is synthetical, it is nevertheless only a singular proposition, insofar as regard is here had merely to the synthesis of the homogeneous, the units. It cannot take place except in one manner, although our use of the numbers is afterwards general. If I say, quote, a triangle can be constructed with three lines, any two of which taken together are greater than the third. End quote. I exercise merely the pure function of the productive imagination, which may draw the lines longer or shorter and construct the angles at its pleasure. On the contrary, the number seven 
is possible only in one manner, and so is likewise the number twelve, which results from the synthesis of seven and five. Such propositions, then, cannot be termed axioms, for in that case we should have an infinity of these, but numerical formulae. The transcendental principle of the mathematics of phenomena greatly enlarges our a priori cognition, for it is by this principle alone that pure mathematics is rendered applicable in all its precision to objects of experience, and without it the validity of this application would not be so self-evident. On the contrary, contradictions and confusions have often arisen on this very point. Phenomena are not things in themselves. Empirical intuition is possible only through pure intuition of space and time. Consequently, what geometry affirms of the latter is indisputably valid of the former. All evasions, such as the statement that objects of sense do not conform to the rules of construction in space, for example, to the rule of the infinite divisibility of lines or angles, must fall to the ground. For if these objections hold good, we deny to space and with it to all mathematics objective validity, and no longer know wherefore and how far mathematics can be applied to phenomena. The synthesis of spaces and times as the essential form of all intuition is that which renders possible the apprehension of a phenomenon, and therefore every external experience. Consequently, all cognition of the objects of experience and whatever mathematics in its pure use proves of the former must necessarily hold good of the latter. All objections are but the chicaneries of an ill-constructed reason, which erroneously thinks to liberate the objects of sense from the formal conditions of our sensibility, and represents these, although mere phenomena, as things in themselves presented as such to our understanding. But in this case, no a priori synthetical cognition of them could be possible. Consequently, not through pure conceptions of space and the science which determines these conceptions, that is to say, geometry would itself be impossible. 2. Anticipations of Perception The principle of these is, in all phenomena, the real, that which is an object of sensation, has intensive quantity, that is, has a degree. Proof Perception is empirical consciousness. That is to say, a consciousness which contains an element of sensation. Phenomena as objects of perception are not pure, that is, merely formal intuitions, like space and time, for they cannot be perceived in themselves. They contain then, over and above the intuition, the materials for an object, through which is represented something existing in space or time. That is to say, they contain the real of sensation, as a representation merely subjective, which gives us merely the consciousness that the subject is affected, 
and which we refer to some external object. Now, a gradual transition from empirical consciousness to pure consciousness is possible, inasmuch as the real in this consciousness entirely vanishes, and there remains a merely formal consciousness a priori of the manifold in time and space. Consequently, there is possible a synthesis also of the production of the quantity of a sensation from its commencement. That is, from the pure intuition equals zero, onwards up to a certain quantity of the sensation. Now, as sensation in itself is not an objective representation, and in it is to be found neither the intuition of space nor of time, it cannot possess any extensive quantity, and yet there does belong to it a quantity, and that by means of its apprehension, in which empirical consciousness can within a certain time rise from nothing equals zero up to its given amount, consequently an intensive quantity. And thus we must ascribe intensive quantity, that is, a degree of influence on sense, to all objects of perception, in so far as this perception contains sensation. All cognition by means of which I am enabled to cognize and determine a priori what belongs to empirical cognition may be called an anticipation, and without doubt this is the sense in which Epicurus employed his expression frolepsis. But as there is in phenomena something which is never cognized a priori, which on this account constitutes the proper difference between pure and empirical cognition, that is to say, sensation, as the matter of perception, it follows that sensation is just that element in cognition which cannot be at all anticipated. On the other hand, we might very well term the pure determinations in space and time, as well in regard to figure as to quantity, anticipations of phenomena, because they represent a priori that which may always be given a posteriori in experience. But suppose that in every sensation, as sensation in general, without any particular sensation being thought of, there existed something which could be cognized a priori. This would deserve to be called anticipation in a special sense special because it may seem surprising to forestall experience in that which concerns the matter of experience, and which we can only derive from itself. Yet such really is the case here. Apprehension by means of sensation alone fills only one moment. That is, if I do not take into consideration a succession of many sensations, as that in the phenomenon, the apprehension of which is not a successive synthesis advancing from parts to an entire representation. Sensation has therefore no extensive quantity. The want of sensation in a moment of time would represent it as empty, consequently equals zero. That which in the empirical intuition corresponds to sensation is reality, realitas, phenomenon. 
that which corresponds to the absence of it, negation equals zero. Now every sensation is capable of diminution, so that it can decrease and thus gradually disappear. Therefore, between reality in a phenomenon and negation, there exists a continuous concatenation of many possible intermediate sensations, the difference of which, from each other, is always smaller than that between the given sensation and zero, or complete negation. That is to say, the real in a phenomenon has always a quantity, which, however, is not discoverable in apprehension, inasmuch as apprehension take place by means of mere sensation in one instant, and not by the successive synthesis of many sensations, and therefore does not progress from parts to the whole. Consequently, it has a quantity, but not an extensive quantity. Now that quantity, which is apprehended only as unity, and in which plurality can be represented only by approximation to negation, equals zero. I term intensive quantity. Consequently, reality in a phenomenon has intensive quantity, that is, a degree. If we consider this reality as cause, be it of a sensation or of another reality in the phenomenon, for example, a change. We call the degree of reality in its character of cause a momentum. For example, the momentum of weight. For this reason that the degree only indicates that quantity, the apprehension of which is not successive, but instantaneous. This, however, I touch upon only in passing, for with causality I have at present nothing to do. Accordingly, every sensation, consequently every reality in phenomena, however small it may be, has a degree, that is, an intensive quantity, which may always be lessened, and between reality and negation there exists a continuous connection of possible realities and possible smaller perceptions. Every color, for example, red, has a degree, which, be it ever so small, is never the smallest, and so it is always with heat, the momentum of weight, etc. This property of quantities, according to which no part of them is the smallest possible, no part simple, is called their continuity. Space and time are quanta continua, because no part of them can be given without enclosing it within boundaries, points, and moments. Consequently, this given part is itself a space or a time. Space, therefore, consists only of spaces, and time only of times. Points and moments are only boundaries, that is, the mere places or positions of their limitation. But places always presuppose intuitions which are to limit or determine them, and we cannot conceive either space or time composed of constituent parts which are given before space or time. Such quantities may also be called flowing because synthesis of the productive imagination in the production of these quantities is a progression in time, the continuity of which we are accustomed 
to indicate by the expression flowing. All phenomena, then, are continuous quantities in respect both to intuition and mere perception, sensation and with it reality. In the former case, they are extensive quantities, in the latter intensive. When the synthesis of the manifold of a phenomenon is interrupted, there results merely an aggregate of several phenomena, and not properly a phenomenon as a quantity, which is not produced by the mere continuation of the productive synthesis of a certain kind, but by the repetition of a synthesis always ceasing. For example, if I call $13 a sum or quantity of money, I employ the term quite correctly, inasmuch as I understand by $13 the value of a mark in standard silver, which is to be sure a continuous quantity, in which no part is the smallest, but every part might constitute a piece of money which would contain material for still smaller pieces. If, however, by the words thirteen dollars, I understand so many coins, be their value in silver what it may, I would be quite erroneous to use the expression a quantity of dollars. On the contrary, I must call them aggregate, that is, a number of coins and as in every number we must have unity as the foundation, so a phenomenon taken as a unity is a quantity, and as such always a continuous quantity, quantum continuum. Now seeing all phenomena, whether considered as extensive or intensive, are continuous quantities, the proposition, quote, all change, transition of a thing from one state into another, is continuous, end quote, might be proved here easily, and with mathematical evidence, were it not that the causality of a change lies entirely beyond the bounds of a transcendental philosophy and presupposes empirical principles. For of the possibility of a cause which changes the condition of things, that is, which determines them to the contrary to a certain given state, the understanding gives us a priori no knowledge. Not merely because it has no insight into the possibility of it, for such insight is absent in several a priori cognitions, but because the notion of change concerns only certain determinations of phenomena, which experience alone can acquaint us with, while their cause lies in the unchangeable. But seeing that we have nothing which we could here employ but the pure fundamental conceptions of all possible experience, among which, of course, nothing empirical can be admitted. We dare not, without injuring the unity of our system, anticipate general physical science, which is built upon certain fundamental experiences. Nevertheless, we are in no want of proofs of the great influence which the principle above developed exercises in the anticipation of perceptions, and even in supplying the want of them, so far as to shield us against the false conclusions which otherwise we might rashly draw. If all reality in perception has a degree,
between which and negation there is an endless sequence of ever smaller degrees, and if, nevertheless, every sense must have a determinate degree of receptivity for sensations, no perception and consequently no experience is possible which can prove either immediately or mediately an entire absence of all reality in a phenomenon. In other words, it is impossible ever to draw from experience a proof of the existence of empty space or of empty time. For in the first place, an entire absence of reality in a sensuous intuition cannot, of course, be an object of perception. Secondly, such absence cannot be deduced from the contemplation of any single phenomenon and the difference of the degrees in its reality. Nor ought it ever to be admitted in explanation of any phenomenon, for if even the complete intuition of a determinate space or time is thoroughly real, that is, if no part thereof is empty, yet because every reality has its degree, which, with the extensive quantity of the phenomenon unchanged, can diminish through endless gradations down to nothing, the void, there must be infinitely graduated degrees with which space or time is filled, and the intensive quantity in different phenomena may be smaller or greater, although the extensive quantity of the intuition remains equal and unaltered. We shall give an example of this. Almost all natural philosophers remarking a great difference in the quantity of the matter of different kinds of bodies with the same volume, partly on account of the momentum of gravity or weight, partly on account of the momentum of resistance to other bodies in motion, conclude unanimously that this volume, extensive quantity of the phenomenon, must be void in all bodies, although in different proportion. But who would suspect that these, for the most part, mathematical and mechanical inquirers into nature should ground their conclusion solely on a metaphysical hypothesis, a sort of hypothesis which they profess to disparage and avoid? Yet this they do, in assuming that the real in space I must not here call it impenetrability or weight, because these are empirical conceptions, is always identical and can only be distinguished according to its extensive quantity, that is, multiplicity. Now, to this presupposition for which they can have no ground in experience, and which consequently is merely metaphysical, I oppose a transcendental demonstration, which it is true will not explain the difference in the filling up of spaces, but which nevertheless completely does away with the supposed necessity of the above-mentioned presupposition that we cannot explain the said difference otherwise than by the hypothesis of empty spaces. This demonstration, moreover, has the merit of setting the understanding at liberty to conceive this distinction in a different manner, if the explanation of the fact requires any such hypothesis. For we perceive that although two equal spaces may be completely filled by matters altogether different, so that in neither of them is there left a single point 
wherein matter is not present. Nevertheless, every reality has its degree of resistance or of weight, which, without diminution of the extensive quantity, can become less and less ad infinitum, before it passes into nothingness and disappears. Thus an expansion which fills a space, for example, caloric or any other reality in the phenomenal world, can decrease in its degrees to infinity, yet without leaving the smallest part of the space empty. On the contrary, filling it with those lesser degrees as completely as another phenomenon could with greater. My intention here is by no means to maintain that this is really the case with the difference of matters in regard to their specific gravity. I wish only to prove from a principle of the pure understanding that the nature of our perceptions makes such a mode of explanation possible, and that it is erroneous to regard the real in a phenomenon as equal, quote, its degree, and different only, quote, its aggregation and extensive quantity, and this too on the pretended authority of an a priori principle of the understanding. Nevertheless, this principle of the anticipation of perception must somewhat startle an inquirer whom initiation into transcendental philosophy has rendered cautious. We must naturally entertain some doubt whether or not the understanding can enounce any such synthetical proposition as that respecting the degree of all reality in phenomena, and consequently the possibility of the internal difference of sensation itself, abstraction being made of its empirical quantity. Thus it is a question not unworthy of solution. Quote, how the understanding can pronounce synthetically and a priori respecting phenomena and thus anticipate these, even in that which is peculiarly and merely empirical, that, namely, which concerns sensation itself. The quality of sensation is in all cases merely empirical, and cannot be represented a priori, for example, colors, taste, etc. But the real, that which corresponds to sensation, in opposition to negation, equals zero, only represents something, the conception of which, in itself, contains a being, ein sein and signifies nothing but the synthesis in an empirical consciousness. That is to say, the empirical consciousness in the internal sense can be raised from zero to every higher degree, so that the very same extensive quantity of intuition in illuminated surface, for example, excites as great a sensation as an aggregate of many other surfaces less illuminated. We can therefore make complete abstraction of the extensive quantity of a phenomenon and represent to ourselves in the mere sensation, in a certain momentum, a synthesis of homogeneous assertion from zero up to the given empirical consciousness. All sensations, therefore, as such, are given only a posteriori, but this property thereof, namely, that they have a degree, can be known a priori. 
It is worthy of remark that in respect to quantities in general, we can cognize a priori only a single quality, namely continuity, but in respect to all quality, the real in phenomena, we cannot cognize a priori anything more than the intensive quantity thereof, namely that they have a degree. All else is left to experience. 3. Analogies of Experience The principle of these is, experience is possible only through the representation of a necessary connection of perceptions. Proof Experience is an empirical cognition that is to say, a cognition which determines an object by means of perceptions. It is therefore a synthesis of perceptions, a synthesis which is not itself contained in perception, but which contains the synthetical unity of the manifold of perception in a consciousness and this unity constitutes the essential of our cognition of objects of the senses, that is, of experience, not merely of intuition or sensation. Now, in experience, our perceptions come together contingently, so that no character of necessity in their connection appears, or can appear from the perceptions themselves, because apprehension is only a placing together of the manifold of empirical intuition, and no representation of a necessity in the connected existence of the phenomena which apprehension brings together is to be discovered therein. But as experience is a cognition of objects by means of perception, it follows that the relation of the existence of the existence of the manifold must be represented in experience, not as it is put together in time, but as it is objectively in time. And as time itself cannot be perceived, the determination of the existence of objects in time can only take place by means of their connection in time in general, consequently only by means of a priori connecting concepts. Now, as these conceptions always possess the character of necessity, Experience is possible only by means of a representation of the necessary connection of perception. The three modi of time are permanence, succession, and coexistence. Accordingly, there are three rules of all relations of time in phenomena according to which the existence of every phenomenon is determined in respect of the unity of all time, and these antecede all experience and render it possible. The general principle of all three analogies rests on the necessary unity of apperception in relation to all possible empirical consciousness, perception, at every time. Consequently, as this unity lies a priori at the foundation of all mental operations, the principle rests on the synthetical unity of all phenomena according to their relation in time. For the original apperception relates to our internal sense, 
the complex of all representations, and indeed relates a priori to its form. That is to say, the relation of the manifold empirical consciousness in time. Now, this manifold must be combined in original apperception according to relations of time, a necessity imposed by the a priori transcendental unity of apperception, to which is subjected all that can belong to my, i.e. my own, cognition, and therefore all that can become an object for me. This synthetical and a priori determined unity in relation of perceptions in time is therefore the rule, quote, all empirical determinations of time must be subject to rules of the general determination of time, end quote. And the analogies of experience of which we are now about to treat must be rules of this nature. The principles have this peculiarity that they do not concern phenomena and the synthesis of the empirical intuition thereof, but merely the existence of phenomena in their relation to each other in regard to existence. Now the mode in which we apprehend a thing in a phenomenon can be determined a priori in such a manner that the rule of its synthesis can give, that is to say, can produce this a priori intuition in every empirical example. But the existence of a phenomena cannot be known a priori, and although we could arrive by this path at a conclusion of the fact of some existence, we could not cognize that existence determinately. That is to say, we should be incapable of anticipating in what respect the empirical intuition of it would be distinguishable from that of others. The two principles above mentioned, which I called mathematical in consideration of the fact of their authorizing the application of mathematic phenomena, relate to these phenomena only in regard to their possibility, and instruct us how phenomena, as far as regards their intuition or the real in their perception, can be generated according to the rules of a mathematical synthesis. Consequently, numerical quantities, and with them the determination of a phenomenon as a quantity, can be employed in the one case as well as in the other. This, for example, out of 200,000 illuminations by the moon, I might compose and give a priori, that is, construct the degree of our sensations of the sunlight. We may therefore entitle these two principles constitutive. This case is very different with those principles whose province it is to subject the existence of phenomena to rules a priori. For, as existence does not admit of being constructed, it is clear that they must only concern the relations of existence and be merely regulative principles. In this case, therefore, neither axioms nor anticipations are to be thought of. Thus, if a perception is given us in a certain relation of time, to other, although undetermined, perceptions, we cannot then say a priori what and how great in quantity the other perception necessarily connected with the former is 
but only how it is connected, quod its existence, in this given modus of time. Analogies in philosophy mean something very different from that which they represent in mathematics. In the latter they are formulae, which announce the equality of two relations of quantity, and are always constitutive, so that if two terms of the proportion are given, the third is also given that is, can be constructed by the aid of these formulae. But in philosophy, analogy is not the equality of two quantitative, but of two qualitative relations. In this case, from the three given terms, I can give a priori and cognize the relation to a fourth member but not this fourth term itself, although I certainly possess a rule to guide me in the search for this fourth term in experience, and a mark to assist me in discovering it. An analogy of experience is therefore only a general rule according to which unity of experience must arise out of perceptions in respect to objects, phenomena, not as a constitutive, but merely as a regulative principle. The same holds good also of the postulates of empirical thought in general, which relate to the synthesis of mere intuition which concerns the form of phenomena, the synthesis of perception, which concerns the matter of phenomena, and the synthesis of experience, which concerns the relation of these perceptions. For they are only regulative principles and clearly distinguishable from the mathematical which are constitutive, not indeed in regard to the certainty which both possess a priori, but in the mode of evidence thereof, consequently also in the manner of demonstration. But what has been observed of all synthetical propositions, and must be particularly remarked in this place, is this, that these analogies possess significance and validity, not as principles of the transcendental, but only as principles of the empirical use of the understanding, and their truth can therefore be proved only as such, and that consequently the phenomena must not be subjoined directly under the categories but only under their schemata. For if the objects to which those principles must be applied were things in themselves, it would be quite impossible to cognize aught concerning them synthetically a priori. But they are nothing but phenomena, a complete knowledge of which a knowledge to which all principles a priori must at least relate, is the only possible experience. It follows that these principles can have nothing else for their aim than the conditions of the empirical cognition in the unity of synthesis of phenomena. But this synthesis is cogitated only in the schema of the pure conception of the understanding, of whose unity as that of a synthesis in general. The category contains the function unrestricted by any sensuous condition. These principles will therefore authorize us to connect phenomena according to an analogy, with the logical and universal unity of conceptions, and consequently to employ 
the categories in the principles themselves, but in the application of them to experience, we shall use only their schemata as the key to their proper application instead of the categories, or rather the latter as restricting conditions under the title of, quote, formulae of the former. A. First Analogy Principle of the Permanence of Substance In all changes of phenomena, substance is permitted, and the quantum thereof in nature is neither increased nor diminished. Proof All phenomena exist in time wherein alone as substratum, that is, as the permanent form of the internal intuition, coexistence and succession can be represented. Consequently, time in which all changes of phenomena must be cogitated, remains and changes not, because it is that in which succession and coexistence can be represented only as determinations thereof. Now, time in itself cannot be an object of perception. It follows that in objects of perception, that is, in phenomena, there must be found a substratum which represents time in general and in which all change or coexistence can be perceived by means of the relation of phenomena to it. But the substratum of all reality, that is, of all that pertains to the existence of things, is substance. All that pertains to existence can be cogitated only as a determination of substance. Consequently, the permanent, in relation to which alone can all relations of time in phenomena be determined, is substance in the world of phenomena, that is, the real in phenomena that which as the substratum of all change remains ever the same. Accordingly, as this cannot change in existence, its quantity in nature can neither be increased nor diminished. Our apprehension of the manifold in a phenomenon is always successive, is consequently always changing. By it alone we could therefore never determine whether this manifold as an object of experience is coexistent or successive, unless it had for a foundation something fixed and permanent, of the existence of which all succession and coexistence are nothing but so many modes, modi of time. Only in the permanent, then, are relations of time possible, for simultaneity and succession are the only relations in time. That is to say, the permanent is the substratum of our empirical representation of time itself, in which alone all determination of time is possible. Permanence is, in fact, just another expression for time, as the abiding correlate of all existence of phenomena, and of all change, and of all coexistence. For change does not affect time itself, but only the phenomena in time. Just as coexistence cannot be regarded as a modus of time itself, seeing that in time no parts are coexistent, but all successive. If we were to attribute succession to time itself, 
we should be obliged to cogitate another time, in which this succession would be possible. It is only by means of the permanent that existence in different parts of the successive series of time receives a quantity which we entitle duration. For in mere succession, existence is perpetually vanishing and recommencing, and therefore never has even the least quantity. Without the permanent, then, no relation in time is possible. Now time in itself is not an object of perception. Consequently, the permanent in phenomena must be regarded as the substratum of all determination of time, and consequently also as the condition of the possibility of all synthetical unity of perceptions that is of experience, and all existence and all change in time can only be regarded as a mode in the existence of that which abides unchangeably. Therefore, in all phenomena, the permanent is the object in itself, that is, the substance phenomenon. But all that changes or can change belongs only to the mode of the existence of this substance of substances, consequently to its determinations. I find that in all ages not only the philosopher but even the common understanding has preposited this permanence as a substratum of all change in phenomena. Indeed, I am compelled to believe that they will always accept this as an indubitable fact. Only the philosopher expresses himself in a more precise and definite manner when he says, quote, In all changes in the world, the substance remains and the accidents alone are changeable. End quote. But of this decidedly synthetical proposition, I nowhere meet with even an attempt at proof. Nay, it very rarely has the good fortune to stand, as it deserves to do, at the head of the pure and entirely a priori laws of nature. In truth, the statement that substance is permanent is tautological. For this very permanence is the ground on which we apply the category of substance to the phenomenon, and we should have been obliged to prove that in all phenomena there is something permanent, of the existence of which the changeable is nothing but a determination. But because a proof of this nature cannot be dogmatical, that is, cannot be drawn from conceptions, inasmuch as it concerns a synthetical proposition a priori, and as philosophers never reflect that such propositions are valid only in relation to possible experience, and therefore cannot be proved except by means of a deduction of the possibility of experience. It is no wonder that while it has served as the foundation of all experience, for we feel the need of it in empirical cognition, it has never been supported by proof. A philosopher was asked, quote, what is the weight of smoke, end quote. He answered, quote, subtract from the weight of the burnt wood the weight of the remaining ashes, and you will have the weight of smoke." End quote. Thus he presumed it to be incontrovertible that even in fire the matter, substance, does not perish, but that only the form of it undergoes a change. In like manner was the saying, 
quote, from nothing comes nothing, end quote, only another inference from the principle or permanence, or rather of the ever-abiding existence of the true subject in phenomena. For if that in the phenomenon which we call substance is to be the proper substratum of all determination of time, it follows that all existence in past as well as in future time must be determinable by means of it alone. Hence we are entitled to apply the term substance to a phenomenon, only because we suppose its existence in all time, a notion which the word permanence does not fully express, as it seems rather to be referable to future time. However, the internal necessity perpetually to be is inseparably connected with the necessity always to have been, and so the expression may stand as it is, gignai di nihilo, nihili in nihilum nil posse reverti, footnote 30 to follow, are two propositions which the ancients never parted, and which people nowadays sometimes mistakenly disjoin because they imagine that the propositions apply to objects as things in themselves, and that the former might be inimical to the dependence, even in respect of its substance also, of the world upon a supreme cause. But this apprehension is entirely needless, for the question in this case is only of phenomena in the sphere of experience, the unity of which never could be possible if we admitted the possibility that new things, in respect to their substance, should arise. For in that case we should lose altogether that which alone can represent the unity of time to wit the identity of the substratum, as to that through which alone all change possesses complete and thorough unity. This permanence is, however, nothing but the manner in which we represent to ourselves the existence of things in the phenomenal world. Footnote 30 Perseus Satire 83 to 84. Quote, nothing can be propounded from nothing, nothing can be returned into nothing. End quote. End footnote. The determinations of a substance, which are only particular modes of its existence, are called accidents. They are always real because they concern the existence of substance. Negations are only determinations which express the non-existence of something in the substance. Now, if to this real in the substance we ascribe a particular existence, for example, to motion as an accident of matter, this existence is called inherence. In contradistinction to the existence of substance, which we call subsistence, but hence arise many misconceptions and it would be a more accurate and just mode of expression to designate the accident only as the mode in which the existence of a substance is positively determined. Meanwhile, by reason of the conditions of the logical exercise of our understanding, it is impossible to avoid separating, as it were, that which in the existence of a substance is subject to change, whilst the substance remains 
and regarding it in relation to that which is properly permanent and radical. On this account, this category of substance stands under the title of relation, rather because it is the condition thereof than because it contains in itself any relation. Now upon this notion of permanence rests the proper notion of the conception change. Origin and extinction are not changes of that which originates or becomes extinct. Change is but a mode of existence. What follows on another mode of existence of the same object? Hence, all that changes is permanent, and only the condition thereof changes. Now, since this mutation affects only determinations which can have a beginning or an end, we must say, employing an expression which seems somewhat paradoxical, quote, only the permanent substance is subject to change. The mutable suffers no change, but rather alteration, that is, when certain determinations cease, others begin." End quote. Change, when cannot be perceived by us except in substances, and origin or extinction in an absolute sense, that does not concern merely a determination of the permanent, cannot be a possible perception, for it is this very notion of the permanent which renders possible the representation of a transition from one state into another, and from non-being to being, which, consequently, can be empirically cognized only as alternating determinations of that which is permanent. Grant that a thing absolutely begins to be, we must then have a point of time in which it was not. But how and by what can we fix and determine this point of time? unless by that which already exists. For a void time preceding is not an object of perception, but if we connect this beginning with objects which existed previously and which continue to exist till the object in question begins to be, then the latter can only be a determination of the former as the permanent. The same holds good of the notion of extinction, for this presupposes the empirical representation of a time in which a phenomenon no longer exists. Substances in the world of phenomena are the substratum of all determinations of time the beginning of some and the ceasing to be of other substances would utterly do away with the only condition of the empirical unity of time. And in that case, phenomena would relate to two different times, in which side-by-side -side existence would pass, which is absurd for there is only one time in which all different times must be placed, not as coexistent, but as successive. Accordingly, permanence is a necessary condition under which alone phenomena as things or objects are determinable in a possible experience. But as regards the empirical criterion of this necessary permanence, and with it of the substantiality of phenomena, we shall find sufficient opportunity to speak of in the sequel.